Matthew 17 today. There was one of those uh, Clint Eastwood movies years ago, and uh, I don't know which one it was, I think like Magnum Force or something, and he had one of those famous Clint Eastwood lines in it uh, at the very end, and he said, a man's got to know his limitations. Remember that one? Although he said it a lot cooler than that, he was like, a man's got to know his limitations. <laughs> or, or Clint does it, you know, it's like ultra cool. And that's true, that statement is true, isn't it? You got, we need to know these things about ourselves, and uh, it's helpful to know the areas that we lack in life, isn't it? Like uh, what we struggle in and not just to like block it out like it's not even there or, or uh, weaknesses that we, we've, we've got, especially, especially in the spiritual realm. And here in Matthew uh, 17, uh, it's, he's going to show us some of these. He takes us through four situations where the disciples proved their human limits and the way that they saw things and the way that they did you know, show just how much they lack in their weaknesses. And, but then the Lord Jesus, here in Matthew 17, demonstrates God's infinite resources. And, you know, we really need that. I know that we come to church sometimes and we're like, boy, I hope he, he teaches on parenting today because I am struggling with these kids. <laughs> or, you know, my husband or my job or, or whatever, those, those issues of life that can just kind of feel overwhelming. And I understand that. And there is a lot of topical stuff in the Bible to address those things in particular. But I'll tell you this, just from my experience as being a Christian for going on 25 years, the thing that helps me the most is when I get a vision of who God is and I see how great he is. And then it puts things in perspective and then I know where to go when I have these difficulties because it's not like I just need a Band-Aid to fix this particular problem or challenge. I need a change of mindset. I, I have to get a, a new uh, view of how things are resolved. And the best thing to do is to understand who God is and who I am not. And so what we're going to learn here today is that our limitations are not God's limitations. And I call this message, God is Unlimited. And as we go through these, I want to show you uh, four areas where the disciples lacked they were limited. And I'll take you through them and they'll be up on the screens for you if you're taking notes or just want to make mental note of it. The first one that we come to here, I call it, they had limited vision. So the first area where the disciples lacked was limited vision. Now, <clears throat> let's actually begin here by looking at the last verse of chapter 16. So if you can kind of look back there, one verse, and I'll start there. And here's what Jesus had to say. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Okay, just uh, uh, as some background here, the chapter divisions in the Bible were not put there by God <laughs> initially. Right? They're not part of the inspired word. I'm not saying that God didn't give scholars wisdom about you know, some of this stuff, but they weren't part of the inerrant word uh, of God. God didn't put the chapter numbers and the verse numbers into the text. Maybe you're new to the Bible and you think that, but that's not true. It, they were added uh, later. And the scholars did it to aid you so that you could find things simpler. You know, wouldn't it be kind of awkward if I said, okay, we're in Matthew today, so open it up somewhere in the middle. <laughs> and remember that part last time we were talking about where it's the cost of discipleship? Well, see if you can find that. And if you can't, you know, look at the person next to you, you know, they're, where they're at, and, or help someone near you. It just, it helps us, right? And the scholars did a pretty good job in numbering them and, and dividing them in chapters and, and so forth. But this verse probably belongs in chapter 17. And that's what I'm getting at. Because the explanation of what he meant, I think, is what comes up next. You see, if you go back to verse 27, Jesus made a statement there that the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And then he went on to say this here. 
Essentially, the disciples would not die until they saw Jesus glorified. Okay? So that's where we're at. Now, what's the problem with that, him saying that? They all died. <laughs> right? They're all dead. And Jesus still hasn't returned a second time in power and glory. So was Jesus wrong? You know, some people say that Jesus was mistaken. Is that what you think? I don't think that. I think actually he resolves that problem in the text next. So now let's move to chapter 17, and I'll start reading here in verses 1 and 2. Look what Matthew says. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Okay, we're told here that Jesus only took three out of the twelve up there with him, Peter, James, and John. They're kind of like the inner circle, these three guys, right? And we don't know why necessarily he, did, he chose to do it like this. Somebody said that they just needed closer supervision than the other guys. <laughs> and maybe that's it. You know, it, it, some of us that are like, think we're like really privileged because we're close to Jesus. Well, maybe it's just because he wants to keep an eye on me, <laughs> you know. So uh, we don't know. That's probably not it. But anyway, that's what some say. But they get to see Jesus in his glorified state, don't they? How cool is that? And it says his bright light is shone like the sun, right? Very cool. Now this uh, vision that they're seeing coincides with what other people saw when they have a vision of the Lord in his glory. Uh, Daniel in the Old Testament talks about a similar vision of the Lord that he had. And then John, who's one of the three here, when he writes Revelation in chapter 1, he has a similar vision of the Lord in, in glory that same way. So what we're seeing is a preview of coming heavenly attractions. It's like a sneak peek into what it will be like, right, when Jesus is glorified. So I think that's what he's referring to back in verse 28. These, not all of them would, uh, would, would, would be gone until they got to see this. But are we sure that that's what he was talking about? Can we be sure? I think we can. Because Peter, who's an eyewitness here, he was there. And when he writes Second Peter, he says that that's what happened here. He actually quotes what something that God says here coming up. And he said that, you know, he received glory from the Father in that moment. And he even says this, one of my favorite uh, statements in the Bible. He says, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. <laughs> there in person, we saw it with our own eyes. And so I take Peter's word for it more than I do any kind of like Bible teacher. <laughs> and he said that that's what was going on here. So he's, it says there in verse 2, he was transfigured. You know, that word is uh, uh, where we get our word metamorphosis. So think about a butterfly being changed. It's, that, it's like a radical transformation in who Jesus, uh, what, what was being shown there. A changed type of a form. It says he, he shown. And you know, we see this in the Bible. When someone comes from heaven, sometimes we see that they shine, right? Like when uh, they go to, when the, when the tomb a stone is rolled away and the angel is sitting there the, uh, is shining like that, right? We see the angels sometimes in the Bible appear in their heavenly form and they're shining. When Moses went up on Sinai and he was in the presence of God, he comes back and he's shining. And that's just the reflection of God. Jesus is shining from within, you know? Some people think that Adam and Eve were clothed in shining like this. That, you know, they were created and they had just this glory of God about them. And then when they fell in their sin that, and they died spiritually, that they lost that. And that's why when they noticed that they were naked all of a sudden and they were ashamed and hid from God because now he can see that they're not like they were. A, a spiritual death has happened. And we don't know that for sure, but it's kind of an interesting thing 
uh, to think about. So here's Jesus showing himself glorified, shining like the sun. But that's not all that's happening. Look at verse 3. It says, And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Okay, what are they talking about? <laughs> well, uh, Mark, in the, uh, in the Gospel of Mark, he said that they were talking about Jesus' coming death in Jerusalem. So that's kind of an amazing thing. I mean, <laughs> what a scene this is. Think about it. Put yourself as one of those apostles there up on probably Mount Hermon and watching this whole thing take place. And we've got Jesus so bright that you need those eclipse glasses that you had last week, you know? <laughs> and, and he's talking to two people who lived like a thousand years ago. <laughs> what in the world is going on? <laughs> Well, again, we're not entirely sure why he's doing this. On the one hand, you know, with Moses and Elijah there, it could be that part of the glory that he's showing and coming into his kingdom, that he would, believers will be there in the presence of the Lord. You know, these Old Testament saints and you guys that know Jesus, you're going to be in his presence when he's, when he's uh, uh, glorified, right? Could be part of it, maybe. On the other hand, and I think this is more of the explanation, that Moses and Elijah are there because of what they represent. I mean, think about it. Moses represents the law. As a matter of fact, over 20 times in the Bible, it tells us that, uh, uh, or the Bible calls God's law the law of Moses. <laughs> One of the apostles, I think it was Paul, said that the law came through Moses. Uh, he's a central figure in the law of God. God gave it to Moses, who in turn gave it to the people and even wrote it down for us to read. The Ten Commandments, he wrote it down. Elijah, on the other hand, is a great prophet in the Old Testament. I mean, when you think of prophets, he's usually the one in the front of the line, isn't he? Mo Elijah is a great prophet. Uh, prophet. And so you have uh, the law and the prophet, right, Re represented there with Jesus. And then Jesus, way back when we were in chapter 5, he pointed out that he was here to fulfill the law and the prophets. So now we're starting to understand what's going on with this vision that they're being shown. Essentially, I think, that he's saying that all the Old Testament that's concerning him, the, the ceremonial laws, the feasts, the, the prophecies concerning the Messiah are now fulfilled in Jesus Christ, in that person. So we've got this incredible thing that's taken place there. It's kind of, I would have loved to have uh, been there. And then this happens. Look at verse 4 with me, would you? It says, Then Peter answered, uh-oh, <laughs> and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. It's good to be here, Lord. Peter is playing the part of Captain Obvious here today. Of course it's good to be here, right? It would be awesome to be there. And so he just kind of blurts out this idea that he's got about making three little tents so they can all hang out there uh, together. I, I, I think he's thinking, he's, Peter, isn't he like a man of action in the Bible? He's always got to do, he's the one who gets out of the boat and walks on the water. You know, he's the one who always is like doing something. He's like, I got to do something. Right? Mark uh, said that he said this because he didn't know what to say. <laughs> isn't that kind of funny? Do you know that the Gospel of Mark was secondhand? Mark probably was young when this was all going on. And so most of Mark, the scholars think that Peter told him about all this stuff. And so can you imagine Peter going, oh, by the way, in this part, just tell him I didn't know what to say, so I just said something, <laughs> you know? I think it's kind of, you guys don't think this is funny. I think this is kind of funny. By the way, just as a side note, um, it's a good idea when you don't know what to say to just be quiet. <laughs> Get yourself into trouble. You know, more and more, uh, the Lord has shown me in my life 
that when I don't know what to say, I should just be quiet, just shut up. <laughs> because we can really step in it, can't we? By saying things just because we think we need to fill the air or whatever. Um, and because I've noticed what happens is usually what comes out is pride. And we don't want to be that, right? So Peter says, hey, let's build three little houses up here. <laughs> One for each of you. And, you know, you can't blame him. He wants to hang out with the Lord and Moses and Elijah. Wouldn't you? I would. You know, it's, this is just, it's like a picture of when we have this great experience with God and we don't want to leave. You know, maybe you've been sitting in a service like this sometimes and just worship. There's one song that the worship team just did, and I'd like to hear that for like an hour, that same song, you know, and just the chorus was just like so ministering to me and the way they were doing it. And, you know, maybe the, you, you hear some. I remember when I was a new Christian and I was going to Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa. And uh, Chuck Smith on, on Wednesday nights, I think it was, or maybe Sunday nights, would just teach for like an hour and a half. <laughs> You know, and I never wanted to leave because I came from a destroyed life. And the Lord was just undoing it all and renewing me through the word. And I just wanted to soak it up. And I would sit there with my, my future wife, my girlfriend at the time, and we would just, I'd be like, this is awesome. And we, we, we would go to church all we could because I'd be like, Chuck's going to die pretty soon. And I want to get all I can from this, you know. And he lived like 15 more years. But... So my point is that, you know, when sometimes we have these like mountaintop experiences and we just want to stay there, right? And that's what, what he's doing. You know, maybe you've been to a retreat that's been great and, you know, you don't want to leave. We have these really cool elder family retreats here where the, our leadership and our church and their families go. And it's such a good time with the Lord and each other. We would often like don't want to leave and they're really short you know just a couple of days and my kids start moaning about leaving even before we leave you know this is so great can we just stay and but you can't stay there forever right at retreats because the people are here <laughs> you see what we get wrong and what Peter's getting wrong is that the experience that we're having with the Lord is not the end right it's just preparation for something else that God wants to do in and through your life now, one more amazing thing here, and then I'll move on. Uh, did you notice that Peter knows who these guys are? It's not like they did introductions, right? You know, <laughs> Moses, Peter, Peter, Moses, Elijah, Elijah, Peter, you know. He doesn't do that. And it's not like they've ever seen pictures of Moses and Elijah on Facebook or anything like that, right? But Peter knows them. How? There's no name tags. You know, um... When you get to heaven, you're not going to have to say, you know, it's not going to have to say, hello, my name is Jonah. Oh, there's Jonah. I know. It's a good thing we have name tags on, you know. We will, we will know and we will be known. Just somehow we're going to know these things. And the Lord's like opening it up to them. And it's a pretty incredible thing. So I look forward to that day. To know and be known. It's a family. It's going to be great. <laughs> Well, now something even more incredible happens. Look at verse 5 and 6 with me, would you? It says, While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. So as the words are coming out of Peter's mouth, let's stay here. Let's make tabernacles. God the Father interrupts him. <laughs> Isn't that great? Hear Jesus. <laughs> you see, coming back to my first uh, point here with you guys today in our scripture about what the disciples lacked, uh, they lacked vision of who the Lord was. And this is a great eye opener for us because we can certainly lack vision. He doesn't even, I mean, he's, spending, he's been with Jesus for a couple of years, Peter has. And he still doesn't really know him that well. So what we're being alerted to here is that, you know, God first spoke to mankind through the law. Moses represents that. And then he spoke to mankind through the prophets. And Elijah represents that. Now, who's he speaking to mankind through? 
his son, right? Jesus. It's as, it's as if the Lord is saying, Peter, do not make them equals. <laughs> They're not going to tabernacle like that. You see, Jesus is not a glorified man. Even though our LDS friends would say he is. Do you know that the Mormon doctrine says that Jesus is just a little further along being a God than, than you are. That you will be a God. And Jesus is just a little bit ahead of you in that. And that is so wrong. That is not in the Bible. You know what the Bible says? Jesus is God the Son. <laughs> Very clearly. And it had to be that way. I love how uh, Henry Ironside put it in his commentary on this. He said, Jesus had to be who he was in order to do what he did. And he's right. Let's go back and read what it says there in verse 6. He says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. You see, Henry's right that Jesus had to be the perfect sinless son of God in order to be a sacrifice for your sins. Nobody else could accomplish that. No glorified man. He's not a glorified man. He's the God man. <laughs> and he paid for all of our sins. Great news. So what this means to me as I was just kind of considering this and going through it is that with, he says to listen to Jesus because Jesus is all we need. That's who we need. He's the final word on everything. <laughs> and he's who we need to pay attention to. He's the fulfillment of everything that Moses and Elijah represented. And this is what's great about uh, New Covenant Christians because there's no need to go back to the old stuff. You know, um, today in our culture, there's sects of Christianity that kind of feel like they need to go back to the old stuff. Like the Hebrew Roots Movement is a good example of that. And there's some like them in that um, they, it's, it's like there's this sense that we need to go back to like the Old Covenant or Jewish ceremony in order to really be complete Christians. But we're being shown here and in lots of places in the New Testament that Jesus fulfills all those things. So it's unnecessary to do those. Sure, it's good to know the origins of Christianity, isn't it? I mean, I have lots of books in my library that tell me and explain to me manners and customs and those kind of things because it helps me because I wasn't around then and I can get in the Jewish mindset and what it meant for the early Christians and, and how this all started. And to go to Israel like I did was a huge uh, uh, education in those things. And then, of course, to know God's plan for the Jewish people. He's not through with the Israelites. He's going to redeem them and save them in the tribulation period. But it's not good to try to keep the old covenant or keep the ceremonies. You don't have to. Do you know what it's best to do? To just hear Jesus, to follow him and be free. Well, they heard the voice of God, didn't they? Verse 6, what did they do? They hit the deck. <laughs> The voice of God. Well, what happens next? Verse 7, it says, But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and do not be afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now as they came down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. They saw Jesus only. I love those four words. Because it's another reminder, you guys, to, to the, those of us who have a limited vision, maybe, of who God is. All you need is him. He's everything. And the more that we get to understand that, the better off you will be when it comes to how you deal with relationships and how you parent and how you are, are an employee, a, a neighbor, a friend, a daughter, a son. He is enough. So Moses and Elijah, they go back to paradise, right? And Peter, James, and John walk back with Jesus, and he says, keep this to yourself. Wait till I'm risen from the dead, and then tell them. And they do. But as they're walking, they have a question. Let's look at verse 10. Maybe you have this question. 
It says, then his disciples asked him, saying, why then do the, do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Okay, well, these guys knew their Old Testament, and they had heard it taught in the synagogue that Elijah has to come before the second, the return, or the Savior would come. As a matter of fact, I want to show you from Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. It'll be up on the screen for you. Look what uh, one of the last verses in the Old Testament says. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Okay, so they knew this, and this would have been taught quite a bit. Elijah's going to return. But put yourself again as one of the disciples. They saw Elijah, and they heard Jesus talking about his death and resurrection, so they're like all confused. You know, they, they grew up expecting Elijah to come before the Messiah. So they ask him this question. I mean, at the Passover meal, even today, the Jews leave uh, an empty a chair uh, and a table setting for Elijah. Have you ever been to a Passover, a traditional one? And that's, just, that's what they do, right? And they even leave the front door open a little bit. And the parents will often have the kids go out and look the, at the front door and say, is Elijah out there? Is he coming? And the kids say, no. Well, maybe next year. You know, it's part of the, the tradition and everything. And, and so that's the kind of stuff that these guys grew up around. So why do the scribes say he must come for when you just showed him, and he's died. He's di he died. Verse 11, Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already, and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them, of John the Baptist. Okay, so there's two things that are happening. On the one hand, there's a future event when Elijah will come in purpose, and I think that's why he was showing it, us those things in the Mount of Transfiguration. But we haven't seen the great and dreadful day of the Lord yet, right? It has to come. You would know <laughs> if we've seen, it's not like the, the political climate in our world, just so you know, <laughs> as bad as it might be, that is not the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He's talking about the great tribulation when God is going to pour out his wrath on an unbelieving world for seven years. So that hasn't happened yet, obviously. But he said there that the spirit of Elijah has already appeared in the form of John the Baptist. And you know what? An angel told John's dad that same thing. I think it's in Luke chapter 1 when uh, the angel Gabriel appears to Zacharias, John's dad, while he's serving in the temple. He's at the altar of incense and he's doing his priestly thing. And Gabriel, the angel, shows up and he says, you're going to have a son, you're going to name him John, and he is going to go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah and turn the hearts of the people towards God. And did John do all those things? You bet he did. <laughs> it was a prophecy of John uh, the Baptist. But, and Jesus acknowledges that, doesn't he, in what we just read? But there has to occur a time when Elijah himself returns. And maybe that's why he showed those two there on the mount with him, Moses and Elijah. You know, many people think that they are the two that appear in the Great Tribulation as the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11 when um, the Antichrist is going off in the world and these uh, two witnesses show up and they prophesy and, and testify against uh, the world of what's happening and the Antichrist uh, and so forth. And, and it could be that those two are Moses and Elijah. I think that they will be, perhaps. Um, could be wrong, but we don't know for sure. And yet Jesus is saying that Elijah is coming before Jesus returns uh, and sets up his kingdom uh, on the earth. And so uh, <clears throat> they had limited vision of God's wonderful plan. And I pray that you would absorb these things and, and seek the Lord so that you 
aren't like them <laughs> and have limited vision of the great things that God is going to do in the future. Okay, so we get into the second area that they lacked, and now they'll go faster here. That was a long one. The second area they lack, I call it, they had limited faith. So that'll be up on the screens for you. Limited faith, beginning in verse 14. It says, And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Okay, well now they're back down and they run into the other nine disciples and this guy whose son is having severe issues and uh, nobody can do anything to help him. The guy wanted God's help. The disciples wanted to help him, but they couldn't do anything. So how does Jesus respond to this? Verse 17. Oh, faithless and perverse generation. That's one thing that you don't want to hear the Lord say to you. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. So it wasn't just a, a medical issue. It was a spiritual issue, wasn't it? Demon possession. That's what was causing the problem all along with that guy. And Jesus casts it out, cures him instantly. But before he did, he called him faithless. Yikes. How long is this going to go on? Haven't I been with you for a couple years now? You see, not only are the disciples limited in their vision of God's plan and who he is, but they're limited in their power over demonic forces. Jesus isn't, is he? He's clearly not. He has authority over all the powers of darkness. And you know what? What's encouraging to me is he's looking for people who have the faith to believe that they can do great things in the name of the Lord. The Bible says he searches the whole world looking for people of faith. Well, then the disciples came to Jesus privately in verse 19 and said, why could we not cast it out? Why could we? That's a good question. <laughs> why couldn't we do it? Because previously, we've seen that the disciples were given the ability to cast out demons from Jesus. But why not this time? Well, he tells them in verse 20, because of your unbelief, for surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. Let me say that again. Nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. You know, um, I try not to judge the disciples too much. I pray that I, when I teach that I'm not all judgy when it comes to these guys. I mean, their lives are examples for us, and that's why it's written, so that we will learn and not make some of the mistakes that they made. But I try not to judge them because we would probably do a lot of the same things they do. They're just human beings who make mistakes, and they wish they would have done things better. I mean, think about putting yourself again in the scene. There's this, it's a spectacle with this boy. Just the, 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 the terror that's going on with the, these epileptic seizures. And, and now we know that even though that's, a, that's a, a, a medical thing, that in this case, it was a demonic thing. It was probably like really shocking to them. And maybe they saw it and they were like kind of scared. Like we, could, <laughs> we can't do anything about that. You know, are you kidding me? <laughs> and... Uh, <clears throat> It's important to recognize that the power of darkness can seem overwhelming. And so then we just kind of throw our hands up. Well, I can't do anything. It's too much. Or we're like these guys. We don't even see something as demonic. We don't really believe that we can have much effect on our culture. So we just don't pray. <laughs> it's 
going to hell, so what am I going to do? So you don't pray. Or we don't really believe that we can lead our atheist friend to Christ, so we don't say anything to him. And as a result, the mountain just stays put. When really, God just said we could move it over there, just by our faith. You see, their unbelief cost them the ability to do something for that kid. But Jesus said in verse 20, all you need is a little faith, like a little bitty mustard seed. <laughs> Doesn't look like much. This is really encouraging to me because if you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, the Bible tells us that you, my friend, have been given a measure of faith just for you. He gave you faith. And it's a gift from God. And you have plenty from him. You don't even need to pray for more faith. In fact, don't. What you need to do is just use what he gave you. That little mustard seed ability. And the way to do that is to have confidence that God is more than able. It's not my power. It's not your power. It's the power of God. Remember, he is unlimited. God is limitless in what he's capable of doing. And that's why he takes us through some of these exercises so he, we will see that and know going forward how to respond. But did you see there in verse 21, he said this kind only comes out with prayer and fasting? Why is it? Why would he say that? And why is that the case? That this kind of stuff, this spiritual warfare, only comes out by prayer and fasting? Well, this is how I sort of interpret this or apply it. That my natural appetites, ours, have to be kept under subjection to God so that my faith has room to flourish. Otherwise, my, the things that I want to do and, and, and you know, my own personal appetite, they'll just take over my life. I was thinking about this yesterday when I was mowing our lawn. <laughs> And in our lawn, we have, the, or in our lawn, in our backyard, we have this uh, raised planter bed, like a garden, you know, that my daughters and I built uh, a few years ago. And what I've noticed is that if I take care of it, that it really produces a lot of fruit. But I'm not taking care of it right now very well. So there's a little bit of fruit. There's a few tomatoes and, you know, a few uh, strawberries and things. But it's kind of overrun by weeds. And I had to spend a lot of time yesterday pulling weeds just because I've let it go and I just don't have time and I'm not that interested in it right now, you know? And, um, but I was thinking about this because my life as a believer can be like that little garden. That God wants to do great things in and through my life, but what I can do is, is to let the weeds just grow in it and, and so then it like pushes the spiritual life out. And in this case, the weeds would be, you know, just in my enjoyment and, and, and adventure and, you know, baseball games and all that stuff. And there's nothing wrong with any of those things. But that's not why I'm here. I am not here to just have constant enjoyment in my life. That's not why I'm here. I am here to be an ambassador for Jesus, and so are you. And so prayer and fasting, what that does is contribute to building up the inner man, the inner woman, you gals. Because what it does is it brings the rest of you and your own desires and wants into subjection so that the spiritual will grow and the flesh will die off. You see, we want to gain ground in the spirit. And in order to do it, you have to do it in the power of God. Prayer, fasting, and here's an example of it. Otherwise, Things like this the disciples are experiencing will just overrun you. You won't do anything about it because you can't. So they had limited faith. Not because of what God gave them. God gave them plenty. God gave you plenty. Don't have limited faith. Okay, the third area they lack now, in beginning of verse 22, they had limited understanding. Number three, limited understanding. Now while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And the third day he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. Well, what the Lord is doing here is, is 
is beginning to prepare them for what's coming. But <laughs> they're limited in what they understood, too. You see, they seem to latch on to the death part a lot when he's talking about it. I mean, I don't think he hardly ever mentions his death without his resurrection connected to that, because that's the whole gospel message. It's not just that Jesus died for your sins, though glorious it is. It's that he was raised from the dead three days later. That's the glorious gospel there. And, but it doesn't seem like they were catching on to the rising again part. And they should have been. And so because of that, it said there in verse 23 that they were exceedingly sorrowful. And you know what? I can be like them if I don't understand God fully. If I'm limited in my understanding of who he is and what he's done, I can be exceedingly sorrowful. It just happened uh, the other day. I was emailing with a pastor friend of mine, and there was a difficult situation that we sort of share in ministry. And, uh, and we were talking about it back and forth in email. And I sent him, uh, uh, you know, just kind of my take on it and sort of the woes <laughs> that I was seeing with it, sort of the bad news <laughs> part. And he responded to me, and, you know, his first word was Maranatha. <laughs> and I was so convicted in that moment. Because Maranatha is really just means come quickly, Lord Jesus. <laughs> and that's the last statement in the Bible. And it's the hope for believers everywhere. Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And, we're, and not only does it mean the second coming of Lord, we can't wait to be with him in paradise, <laughs> but Maranatha right now in this situation, in the way that we view things. And in that moment, I was exceedingly sorrowful, at least somewhat sorrowful, because I had a limited understanding of who God is. That pastor has a better understanding of who God is. And I think if we have a limited understanding, we become exceedingly sorrowful, even as Christians, and we should know better. So here's a, a little encouragement for you today, and that's keep doing what you're doing here. Grow in your understanding, in your walk, in the actual doing of what he says so that you will not fall into this kind of place where you're like, you're only looking at the bad and you don't see any of the good that's coming that he's going to do. Because to be a Christian should be very hopeful. <laughs> okay, one more area that they lack, number four, and we'll finish up with this one. I call it limited possibilities. Number four, limited possibilities. Verse 24, when they had come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the temple tax? Okay, a little background would be helpful here. Every adult Jewish male would have to pay a half a shekel every year uh, for the temple as a tax. Um, it was for the upkeep of the temple. Now, this began as a law in Exodus 30, so that's why they were doing it. But back then, it was supposed to be a free will offering, and now it's a tax, <laughs> right? So they're taxing all the adult uh, males. So they, uh, they're rolling into Peter's hometown, Capernaum. And Jesus would stay with Peter quite a bit. That's where Jesus spent a lot of his ministry there in Capernaum. And as they're coming through, they, the collectors see Peter, and they say, hey, Hey, your rabbi, Jesus, he's going to pay the temple tax, isn't he? So what does Peter say? Look at verse 25. He said, yes. And when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him saying, what do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? Peter said to him, from strangers. Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. <clears throat> I don't know about you, I came from a destroyed past. And uh, I was a, a prisoner of the enemy until I was uh, going on 31 years old. And so I remember what that was like uh, very clearly. And when we come to things like this, those last few words there, they just minister to me so much because I enjoy being free in Christ. Don't you enjoy being, you don't have to go through what I went through in order to enjoy the freedom of Christ, but boy, I'll tell you what, 
I don't want to be under any kind of uh, uh, enemy captivity uh, anymore because I know what it's like to be free in the Lord. And so do many of you guys. And it's just so sweet that the sons of God are free. And so Peter said there, what we just read in verse 25 and 26, that he's like, of course Jesus will pay it. And Jesus anticipated it because he knows everything. And he asked him a question. He says, well, who do the kings tax? The citizens or their kids? <laughs> and Peter says, well, the citizens, uh, of course. And he says, yep, that's right. So the sons are free. You see what he's doing is Jesus is equating the temple to belonging to the Lord God, right? Which, of course, it did. It was his idea. <laughs> And so Jesus isn't obligated to pay taxes because he's the son of God, right? Any more than a son of a king would have to pay taxes to his dad, you know? Well, let's finish here, verse 27. He says this, Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up first. And when you have opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for you and me. Jesus never does things the way you think he will, does he? He's amazing. I can't wait to see him face to face. Now, I want to draw your attention to the fact that Jesus did this, not because he had to, but because he didn't want to stumble those people, lest we offend them. Great example of not demanding your liberty. We just talked about, I just mentioned that we're free in Christ, are we not? We Christians, we're free in Christ. Paul said, the only thing that we owe people is to love them. <laughs> that keeps me free, is to love people and to be willing to give up things that might, you know, bring me back into bondage. You can voluntarily live sort of a stricter life <laughs> than your liberty allows just so that you don't stumble people or, or offend them, just like Jesus. The tax isn't for him. He's the son. <laughs> but so everyone isn't offended, go catch the fish and the coin will be in there. <laughs> That's crazy, isn't it? And again, it's just so that you and I, one last time here, as we wrap up, will see that God is unlimited. He can do anything. I mean, there's one fish in the Sea of Galilee that has a coin in its mouth. Does Jesus put it in there, or did the fish swallow the coin already? You know, we don't know. But he knew that Peter, if he threw in a hook, that he would catch uh, this fish. You see, the possibilities with God are limitless. And here's just a great uh, example of that. Oh, and one last thing. Did you see that he paid Peter's tax too? Did you catch that? What a great picture of how the Lord paid your price and my price. He didn't have to, right? But he did it because he loves us. He loved Peter and he loves you. And I just want to talk to you for a moment if you're not a Christian yet. And one of the reasons you're probably here today is because God loves you so much that he wants you in his family. And he wants you to know that he paid your price. What I mean is the Bible tells us that all people, every human being, has fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned and come short. That means we've missed the mark of perfection. And whether it's the things we've thought or the things that we've done, that we've offended God in some way, whether it was lies or stealing or lusting after things we ought not lust after or people. And God knows this about us and that we have a sin nature. And yet he doesn't just leave us to destruction. He sends his only son so that you can be free in Christ. And all it requires is for you to put your trust in him. The one who came to pay your price. Who died a horrible death on a Roman cross so that you would not face the wrath of God. And so I would ask you today as we begin to, to finish up here today. That if you haven't put your trust in Christ that you would do it today. And we're going to pray for you. And I want you to know that God loves you. He loves you. And I hope you recognize that through the sacrifice of Jesus. I want to invite the worship team back up to sing a last song for us. And as they do, just a couple things here to remind you about what we covered 
kind of to take home with you and in your back pocket. <laughs> Uh, it's helpful to know our limitations, isn't it? Our limitations. Uh, we saw that uh, the disciples were limited in their vision of who God was. They were limited in their faith. <laughs> they were limited in uh, uh, how they understood who Jesus was. And they were even limited in their possibilities. Wow, they saw the possibilities of God. And I pray that you and I would not be like that, that we would learn from their mistake and that we would see that God is unrestricted he's infinite he can do anything that he wants to do and I'll tell you this as I close that he can do for you and through you right now what look like impossible things and so have faith in your God